Hello, thank you for joining me. Um, I wanted to put together a video to carry on with some of my research into daffodils. Anybody who follows me on Facebook will have seen that a couple of weeks ago I was talking about daffodils, I was talking about Wordsworth and I was talking about the influence of daffodils on the poetry of Wordsworth. Um, I've been looking into daffodils a bit more um, and I've found out quite a lot of information, a lot more than I thought I would be finding out. And so with that in mind, I'm going to carry on talking about the daffodil. So I'm going to start with the Narcissus pseudonarcissus, which is the English or wild daffodil. It is shorter than its ornamental counterparts and it is much harder to find. The Narcissus pseudonarcissus flowers in woodland, in damp woodland and meadows and particularly in ancient woodland. They were once widespread across the whole of the UK but now we find them more in colonies in areas of England and Wales. The Woodland Trust on its website notes that here in Northamptonshire one of the best places to see the English daffodil or the Narcissus pseudonarcissus is in a woodland called Everdon Stubbs. This is an ancient woodland where you'll find not only the daffodil but you will find plenty of bluebells, beautiful bluebells. Um, and at the moment, I was there a couple of days ago, the uh, woodland anemone and the violet are all coming out. There's quite a lot of that about. Um, and it's making the whole of the woodland look rather magical and mystical and that will really develop as the bluebells come through we'll start to see that haze and that glow of the purple and the blue that the bluebells give us and once we have the daffodils um, with the sunlight hitting those the contrast of the bright yellow with the purple and blues will be quite magical um, and giving an almost mystical feel to this ancient woodland, which is Everton Stubbs. Um, Everton Stubbs is also a site of special scientific interest, and it is the site of a prehistoric Saxon burial. So there is more to Everton Stubbs than just the woodland and just the flowers. There's a lot of history there. It is ancient. The village is very old too, well worth a visit. So if you're in the area, or you fancy doing something slightly different, get out to Everton Stubbs when it's safe to do so um, and you'll have a wonderful time exploring the woodland um, and hopefully you might see some of the Narcissus pseudo-Narcissus. As well as the English daffodil here in the UK, we also have the Narcissus ovularis, which is the Tenby or Welsh daffodil. Um, this is much bigger and much more striking than the English daffodil. Although evidence does suggest that it may not be native to Wales. In the 19th century, there was a cultural revival going on in Wales. <clears throat> this was a romantic movement of scholars and various Welsh people who were trying to revive Welsh culture, Welsh history, Welsh art in order to save it from being lost forever. <clears throat> and a lot was invented in this attempt to revive Welshness. <clears throat> Excuse me. And the daffodil was one of the things that was invented perhaps as a signifier of Welshness, an identifier of Welsh identity. <clears throat> Wales already had a national symbol and this was and is the league that was already in place. But that was not paid too much heed when it came to the cultural revival of Wales. The daffodil was preferred over the leek. The reason for this may well be that the leek and the daffodil have very similar names in Welsh. The <coughs> Welsh for daffodil actually means Peter's leek. 
so it became an obvious choice to become the symbol of Wales. Now this was really helped when the Welsh Prime Minister Lloyd George popularised the wearing of daffodil on the lapel for St David's Day. <clears throat> it became then really adopted as a symbol of Welsh identity. Daffodils are of course linked to the story of Narcissus, the Greek youth who fell in love with his own reflection. Now he died after staring at his reflection in a pool of water and it is believed that daffodils grow on the spot where he died, bowing their heads and gazing into the water just as Narcissus had done. However, again, there is no real evidence that links the daffodil with the Greek myth or story of Narcissus the youth. In fact, the Roman Pliny the Elder wrote that the plant was named because of its fragrance rather than for any association with Narcissus and the myth. The daffodil fragrance has been described as being intoxicating and as being stupefying. So the Greek word narco means I grow numb <clears throat> and this has quite a clear then association with the concept of the daffodil scent or fragrance being stupefying, nullifying or um, indeed intoxicating. And in Christianity, daffodils are known as the Lent Lily. And this is simply because they flower from March through to April, which is the run up to Easter. Um, and because of this association in Christianity with Easter, the they, daffodils are symbols of hope and of resurrection. If we look at the Middle East, and Middle Eastern art in particular, we see that the daffodil begins to be seen as an indoor plant as well as an outdoor plant. So not just a cultivated ornamental plant, it is brought inside. The reason it's brought inside is sometimes as a way of displaying wealth and power, but also importantly, because of the use of the daffodil and the daffodil bulb in particular um, in medicinal purposes and for sort of health care around the house and the home. Um, the ancient Greeks used the daffodil, or certainly an extract from the daffodil, as an emetic, which is a vomit inducer. They used it as a diuretic and they helped it with wound, used it to help with wound healing and to help fight infections. However, too much of the daffodil bulb extract would result in death, and therefore the ancient Greeks had an association for the daffodil with death, as opposed to the Christians who call it the Lent lily, who associate daffodils with hope and with resurrection. Um, the Romans also used the bulb and leaf extract to make a cream to help with um, infection and wound healing. Um, and the Tudors and the Victorians even did very similar. So the Victorians are not that long ago from where we are now. Um, and so until fairly recent times, the power of the daffodil, particularly the daffodil bulb, um, in medicine has been well established and really well utilised. So if we think about the present day, um, research is ongoing into the daffodil and daffodil bulb and what we're finding is that they contain a series of compounds which are alkaloids. Um, 
and these are mainly present in the bulb. It, it seems to be the bulb that um, provides most of the medic medicinal properties that we need and that we're using. One of the compounds that is present in the bulb is called galanthamine. Um, and this is known to be useful in preventing the breakdown of a molecule called acetylcholine. Now, acetylcholine is a neurotransmitter present in the brain. So the presence of acetylcholine is vital to healthy brain function. Research shows that by increasing the amount of acetylcholine present, we can help to slow down and inhibit the advancing stages of Alzheimer's and dementia. Since the mid-1990s, the bulbs have been used to help with mild to moderate Alzheimer's in this way, and also research is starting to look into other quite significant illnesses such as cancers. So far in the UK, really, daffodils have been grown for ornamental purposes as flowers, as plants to decorate our homes with, to plant in our gardens. So this research into um, galanthamine, its uses and its impact upon dementia and Alzheimer's is very exciting, although that sort of research has not really been carried out for too long in the UK. I imagine that going forward, due to these advances and these revelations that we're coming across, um, that will certainly be a side of the daffodil bulb and um, growing that will be extended and expanded upon, which will hopefully bring us very good news in our treatments of dementia, Alzheimer's and those sort of significant illnesses and diseases. So I had no idea when I first started looking into the humble daffodil that it would be such an interesting and such a fascinating plant and flower. I've always enjoyed looking at it during the springtime. Um, but I'm thrilled to know that it has such a long history, such a varied history and that it will hopefully continue to go down, perhaps in the history books, as being a significant player um, in terms of the health and welfare of human beings, perhaps all creatures, who knows, as we go forwards. So I hope you've enjoyed listening to my facts and my studying of the daffodil. I would love to hear from you if you have any interesting facts, if you've researched the daffodil yourself, if you know anything extra that you can add to my knowledge, I would love to hear from you. Please leave a comment or get in touch. Uh, or maybe you have some great links to research that you can let me know about. I would love to receive those and that will help me to continue my research into um, particularly the medicinal aspect um, of the daffodil and the daffodil bulb which I think is the most exciting area. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you've enjoyed it. Um, and I shall continue to post anything more that I find out and that I think will be of interest. So thank you very much. Take care. And until I speak to you again, have a lovely week. Thank you. Bye.